Hey everyone, welcome. Dominic here with Smart Catholics and uh, really, really glad to be joined by Ben Wolliver. How do you pronounce your last name, Ben? Uh, just like you did, Wolliver. Like we Perfect. pulled the wool over your eyes, we like to say. <laughs> well, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Ben is the, he plays the role of someone named Benjamin Cello in a an amazing series for, for children. Uh, ben, we're going to get to that in just a second. So, Smart Catholics Mastermind, it's a live series to meet the minds and hearts of Catholic creators. They devote their time and talent to mastering their vocation so that you can live a fuller life faster. So, um, like I said, Ben Wolliver plays the role of Benjamin Cello. He's a cellist, a writer, an actor, and a teacher. Uh, he studied cello. He's got a BA in English. He's performed on stage in places like Carnegie Hall, toured Europe. He's released chart-topping albums. And he today teaches aesthetics and theology at the Conservatory of Annie Moses. And somehow you have time to record this incredible series for kids. Uh, like I said offline, I found you six months ago, and as soon as I saw it, I thought, I want that for my little girl. So Good. before getting into that, let's meet you. Like, Ben, who, like, how did you start this whole thing? Like, what was going on at that time? And you realized, we need to start a show for kids. Oh, wow. Well, that's, it, it's a big story. It, you know, it, my family, it's really a family affair, what we do. Uh, my family, uh, we all were raised studying classical music. So I studied cello, my siblings studied violin, mandolin, viola, a bunch of other instruments. And uh, we were very aggressive in our studies and that took us to the Juilliard School for about three years. And then we started the Annie Moses Band, which is how we played at Carnegie and the Grand Ole Opry and other places. And that has been happening over 20 years that we've been touring. Um, but probably about five years ago, uh, our mother Robin, who is a long time playwright and writer of children's music uh, with uh, our father, Bill, who is also a composer and arranger. Mm -hmm. She had this idea for a show that would be Mary Poppins meets Mr. Rogers, just something that was mm -hmm. um, old but new, um, something that would be a mentor figure for children, mm -hmm. that would teach uh, the Catholic faith, that would teach scripture and old hymns and just all kinds of beautiful lessons that we felt the younger generation needed to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put together a pilot and shopped it around to several major streaming platforms and <clears throat> immediately uh, were met with a really interesting response. They loved the show, mm -hmm. but they wanted to take God out of it. And for us, of course, that was a non sequitur. So we said, well, how do we move forward? And we're just wondering what to do. Um, and suddenly uh, we came across a big piece of property south of Nashville that had a big warehouse on it that was just perfect for our purposes, but that needed a extensive renovation. So we decided to self-fund all of season one. So we spent about six months renovating that space, filmed the first season and released it. Uh, on Form, other uh, streaming platforms, and just were met with a tremendous response. And so it's been an honor and a privilege to impact children through this series, and we're really excited to release season two. So you self-funded, and then just you all just created the whole thing. I mean, it looks as incredible and and just as fun as all the stuff we see on Saturday morning TV and or 3 p.m. kids hour, you know. How did yeah. you do it all? <laughs> you know, it's a God thing. Uh, there's really no other way to explain it. You know, my, uh, so kind of give you a, a sense of, of who we are as a company. Um, uh, our mother, Robin, like I said, is the uh, founder, creator of Benjamin Cello, and she's been writing for over 30 years in this genre of children's music. And so uh, our father, Bill, and her have just this incredible backlog of songs and ideas um, that really fit perfectly into this concept of Benjamin Cello. And then all of us are lifelong performers. I mean, we've uh, toured as the Annie Moses Band over 20 years together. Uh, my sister Annie, who plays violin and is a singer. Uh, my brother Alex, who plays viola and is also a singer. He's our producer and director, a great cameraman and a fantastic editor. Um, then I come next in the lineup. There's seven of us. And obviously I love to act and to write and play the cello. 
Um, and then we have uh, two sisters, Camille, who plays Harp, and uh, who you would know through the Annie Moses Band. She hasn't appeared yet on the show. Uh, and then Gretchen, who plays Miss Gretchen, the music teacher. She's my sister and plays mandolin and violin. And then our brother Jeremiah, who makes his debut in season two, is one of the stump jumpers, which is this really fun barbershop quartet of lay brothers who love to preach the word and share scripture through song. So he makes his debut. And then seventh of all is our uh, adopted sister, Zoe, who's uh, just about to turn 12. So uh, it's a... Uh, it's really a family affair. Um, my sister-in-law, Berkeley, who's married to my brother, Alex, she plays Lolly Popular um, at Penny Whistle Park, and she is the creative director of everything that you see. So when you look at the artwork for the series, um, uh, the shadow puppets for the Easter special that we did, all of it is really Berkeley's work. Um, musically, uh, my father, Bill, is really the mastermind, uh, along with Robin, for a lot of the music. Mm -hmm. And then finally, James De Silva, who plays Cowboy Roy, is my brother-in-law. He's married to Camille. And wow. uh, all of it, you know, it's funny. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, my mother Robin loves to do. She loves to look at people and say, you know, who, who could they be? You know, what, what's their knack? What's their personality? So one example is my brother-in-law, James. He has this hilarious cowboy routine where he'll break into, you know, a southern drawl and start to just say the most outrageous things. And it would set us all rolling with laughter at family gatherings. And my mom said, hey, why don't we take that and include it in this show? So a lot of the things that you see on the show are serendipitous. They're just God bringing the right people uh, into community. And we have a great time putting it together. So. I love that sense of just how um, everybody doing what, what kind of comes natural to them and, and natural talents. And then it's a family thing. So in a way, you're just getting a peek under the hood at how a family likes to have fun together. I mean, So you've yeah. got this really, really cool phrase where you're welcoming children to the land of the baptized imagination. So what's that? Yeah, the baptized imagination. It's a concept that we first read um, in the writings of C.S. Lewis, who was obviously a huge uh, inspiration in children's literature with the Chronicles of Narnia. And he talked about how when he was an atheist, that his imagination was baptized mm -hmm. by encountering the writings of George MacDonald, who was a fantasy writer and a, and a devout Christian. And that image always stayed with us. And, and it's interesting, if you look at a lot of the church fathers and what they said about the sacrament of baptism, they called it illumination. So it was about this Holy Spirit coming into your mind and opening your eyes to the invisible realities that just the, the carnal mind couldn't see. Mm -hmm. And that is really what the baptized imagination is about and, and what the show is about. We're trying to take these concepts that maybe are hard to explain. You know, uh, how do you explain an invisible world? you know, to right. a young child? How do you explain things like the sacraments and, and the holy scriptures? And there's a tremendous amount of imagination that yeah. comes into play with the spiritual life, and yet we need that illumination mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. So for us, it's like a guided tour for children where they begin to encounter these mysteries that God has delivered to us through revelation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's our joy to communicate that. I think that's incredible. And I love I love the way you've articulated that with that sense of illumining, not not replacing and then here, use this, but here's an additional insight to see how God wor is working, has worked, and continues to work through all the other stuff, you know. And that's the cool thing about baptism is it, the thing that's there doesn't go away, but it, it gets cleaner, clearer. Right. Um, and I mean, you end up reading that in C.S. Lewis, he's got all these ancient mythical things and so on in there, but then he's he's found the thread in them that that connects them in a way to a deeper Christian, you know, reality. So, so this is a project that uh, uh, your mother had dreamed up, and then I'm curious, like, how did this kind of influence your? Uh, I believe you're you're Catholic now, you and and your family. Is that that right? Yeah, we all entered the church together back in 2013. So oh, yes. your family or your entire family? Uh, my entire family. So all wow. seven siblings and then my parents as well. So Okay, so that's incredible. How does that happen? 
<laughs> Have you seen the movie Tenet? I know that's not in the branding of Benjamin Cello, but it's kind of like that uh, temporal yeah. movie. You know? <laughs> I can't believe uh, you brought that up, but that's it, awesome. <laughs> it, it kind of how that works for us. Uh, my my uh, mother and my sister Annie went to Rome for a Protestant Catholic gathering uh, that they were just invited to out of the blue. And it was one of those things where, if I remember correctly, I don't think we necessarily had just money to go to Rome. You know, it, just, it was just very serendipitous. And we said, well, why don't you go? Just go. You know, you never know if the Holy Spirit's going to do something. And, and, um, and then, so they went and my mother had what she called, she's not very charismatic, but she had what she called the slain in the spirit moment in St. Peter's Basilica going through the doors. She just dropped to her knees and began to weep and was just wow. tremendously moved wow. by that experience. So they came back and they were just trying to process that. So that was a grace gift from God, just a, a download, you know. Okay. And, uh, and then my brother, Alex, and I, um, we had attended a Calvinist moral philosophy course. Um, that meant over 20, uh, no, maybe 2007, 2008, we did that. And that got us to reading a lot of Catholic literature, because we just didn't agree with a lot of what our professors were sharing. I say, why would you be doing that? In a, in yeah, a I know. Well, we weren't Calvinist. We just, it was a kind of a great books course. We love to read, you know, we want to read the original texts and, you know, St. Augustine's City of God and those things. And so we had that in common, but we quickly found that, you know, it was a cross purposes situation. So we started to really dive deep into the church fathers. And then my brother Alex had an experience where he saw Christ um, I guess in kind of a waking vision and Christ just looked at him and said, I'm Catholic. And, um, and he told that to us. And I remember trying to process that, you know, just saying, well, what does that mean? Um, for myself, I love history. So I started to really do some deep study after that and pretty quickly found because I love history that the historical argument for the church was way stronger than I thought it had been. Wow. And, uh, and so once I realized that, I said, okay, I need to, you know, change my priorities, start to change how I think about this. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing I like to tell people when they ask me why I'm Catholic is, you know, th there are reasons why I became Catholic, um, but the reasons why I stay Catholic, the reasons why I go to Mass and, gotcha. and is because um, there's power in the sacraments. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something people don't know outside the church. They, you know, you don't know what you miss, right? right? And, you know, going into confession, having your sins absolved. Uh, I'll never forget my first confession. Uh, just the weight that lifted off, you know, 20 something years of, you know, sin baggage <laughs> accumulated. Uh, it was a powerful experience. Uh, so that's what I try to communicate to people who aren't Catholic now. I try to. You know, I think Lewis had a, a, a metaphor where he talked about someone who has heard a symphony mm -hmm. and then they talk to someone who's never heard a symphony right. and you're trying to communicate, well, there's a cello and there's a viola and there's a violin and they, when they play together, that's the thing. And, and uh, I think when you're speaking to someone who isn't Catholic, they haven't experienced confession. They haven't experienced the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's like that gulf between someone who's heard a symphony and someone who hasn't or only heard part of a symphony. So uh, that's what I try to communicate to people is there's more in the church than you know. You know, there's more, uh, what was Hamlet's line? There's more in the whole universe Horatio than is there are more things in heaven Catholicism. and earth than are That's the thing of beauty of Catholicism. When you have the fullness, fullness is limitless, right? Wow. It just keeps building on itself. Man, you've there are so many questions I want to ask you, but we're basically out of time here. I, I do want to go back to, you'd mentioned that, that beautiful vision that, that your, your brother had had. And I'm curious how you have now, um, how you think about it. Like when Christ says, I am Catholic, does that mean to you? Like, how do I say this? I am of this tribe over here that you're not in, or I am more universal than how you've conceived, you know, your identity or something. 
Yeah, well, that's it's a deep question. Um, you know, I know there's the scripture where Paul talks about, you know, some say I'm of Apollos and I'm of Peter and I'm of Christ. And, and of course, that's what you see. Uh, I remember uh, my mother, her background was Church of Christ. And uh, I, a lot of Catholics I know don't know the ins and outs of Protestant denominations, but Church of Christ began as a denomination that was trying to be universal. It was trying to be kind of find these fundamental truths that everyone could agree on and then we could, you know, put everything else aside. And, and of course it failed, you know, it became a denomination. Mm -hmm. And I've thought about that, you know, because what separates true Catholicity from just saying the word Catholic, right? Saying mm -hmm. something's Catholic, saying something's universal, but it doesn't have that power. And, I think the answer is that uh, the church is Christ's mystical body and uh, the church is the subject of history, you know? Um, Ooh, that's a great. It's, it's the subject of history and, and Christ is the central character of history. So his body as the subject of history, it's not that it's this rigorous, institution the institution's important like it it's there it's of necessity but the subject that is the church you're either in it or you're standing outside of it criticizing it and um i think a lot of catholics actually stand outside the church they may be in the church in some sense but they stand outside the church and they criticize it and they you know stand apart whether it's from a traditionalist perspective or from a liberal perspective, right? You know, it, it, can, right. it can happen either way. Right. And then there are people who are, you know, outside the church and they critique the church from that side. But then there are people who they don't know, you know, they just don't know, but maybe their hearts are open right. to being part of the church. And those people, those are the people who I think, you know, you're my brother, you're my sister, you know, you don't know it yet, mm -hmm. but and, and the fullness is there waiting for you. So, um, yeah, I know that's a long, maybe complicated answer. No, I don't think there's an easy yeah. answer. You know, Christ <laughs> usually speaks in, well, like sometimes anyway, in puns or yeah, you know, it's, it's meant to like shake your life and get you to really think I'm mm -hmm. Ben, that's, that's just an amazing story. Thank you for uh, taking the time to join us. And, and it's, I hope that plenty of the, members of the smart Catholics community can, can check it out and share it with your, with their kids. Yes. Um, go to Benjamin and you okay. can purchase season one or season two on DVD and uh, the ability to stream. So it's a, uh, it's a, a true joy to offer this to parents and family. And uh, we hope to have many more seasons to come. That's amazing. Well, I will drop that in the show notes for those who catch this later. So Benjamin uh, to wrap up here, Ben, if you had one minute to share uh, a message to the world, especially about about your faith and what's really important, what what would you say? Well, <clears throat> our our heart is children. You know, uh, we live in a time where there's a lot of darkness, there's a lot of confusion, and we have these little ones that are in our in our hands. And we have the opportunity to give them the very best. And uh, when we film a Benjamin Cello episode, we want it to be as excellent as possible. We want to make sure that every second that we have a child, we're filling it with truth. We're filling that child with um, beauty and goodness, something they can hold on to. Uh, something that we talk about a lot is the scientific fact that an Alzheimer's patient who doesn't even remember their own name will still remember the songs they sang when they were little. And so the music that we're teaching these young people, you know, my, my niece singing, um, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The lyric of one song we wrote, uh, these messages burrow deep into their hearts. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tomb, bestowing life. Those words, can go so deep and they can define who someone is. And so I hope that parents will, you know, look to their children and join us as we play a small part in that mission 
to evangelize the next generation. I think that's that's just brilliant, Ben. Thank God for you answering that call. Thank God for your family. And uh, I hope that you continue to do that. I'm definitely getting this from my little one. I hope plenty more can jump in and uh, join you all. Um, for those who are catching the replay or who are watching this, um, if you enjoy this, please share it with the one friend that you think would like to see it and then come and regroup with us in the free Catholic community on smartcatholics.com. We are free of trolls and ads and toxicity. We are faithful to the Holy Father, Pope Francis, and the Church. We are committed to a culture of kindness and learning. Does it sound like you? Well, then come and join us. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Dominic.